maybe that dovetails into the next question then, which is around the next dietary pattern of intermittent fasting. You know, how can this potentially help listeners or folks who are struggling with uh, prediabetes or type 2 diabetes? Sure. Um, so intermittent fasting actually is, is challenging to um, talk about because there's no real definition. Um, so, for example, you could be intermittent fasting if you don't eat anything on one day of the week um, and eat normally on five. Um, some people may eat 400 calories a day on two days a week. Those days might be consecutive or separate. So there are different definitions. Um, and then, of course, we have time restricted feeding, um, which is it seems to be a very interesting area, but we don't have much research on where people eat every day, but they restrict their food consumption to a window of time. Um, so it might be 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. they can eat the rest of the time they don't. Um, so as far as any of the underlying pathophysiology, we can't make any conclusions yet, um, simply because all of the studies done are too different to make comparisons. Um, there are some intermittent fasting studies that show increases in insulin resistant. Uh, some show improvements. Um, I think that's just to do with the protocol used. There was a very interesting study. It was it was a small study, but but pretty compelling um, that came out in cell metabolism. I think it was earlier this year where it was obese males with prediabetes. It was a very carefully controlled study. Um, so there was no weight loss or weight gain over the study. But in the intervention group, they were restricted, I think it was 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, and they could eat normally the rest of, or they couldn't eat the rest of the time. And then the control group, they could eat normally. And what those data showed, no differences in weight loss, but the intervention group, so if you restricted your feeding to 8 a.m. or from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., you've got improvements in fat oxidation and improvements in insulin sensitivity. Um, so I think that's interesting. We need a lot more data because that was a very small study. Um, so I don't think yet we can say that intermittent fasting as a strategy um, is going to do anything special. But again, some folks like following it because it helps them lose weight and manage their weight loss. Um, so again, as a strategy, I think they're um, certainly something we could be offering patients. Yeah, it's 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 interesting that um, you know today folks getting up in the morning early six seven o'clock and that's when they have their first meal and of course with technology and Netflix and everything else people are continually eating snacking through the day and then having another snack before they go to bed on the couch so you know the time in which we're consuming food now it just stretches to 14 16 18 hours a day so there's periods of giving the body a break and then allowing for some of that fat oxidation things to take place so it seems like there could be you know time restricted feeding can be a, a nice heuristic for folks if it does help them to um, control caloric intake um, yeah, absolutely. Would, you, would you agree absolutely yes I, I definitely think so I mean I think number one um like you say, just restricting caloric intake, that, that I think what's really hard is thinking all the time about what to eat because we're so inundated with choice. And I just think the idea, you know, if it works for people of just saying, well, it's 2, 2 p.m., I can't eat now, and you just kind of adjust to that. Um, but I definitely think time-restricted feeding is particularly interesting um, because, like you say, of this rest period that you have every day, um, whether, whether I mean, this is conjecture, whether it's giving beta cells a rest, whether it's letting insulin sensitivity restore. Um, and I think what we've got to figure out is ways, the optimal balance between time restricted feeding and having a fun life. Um, and I've discussed the, the cell metabolism study with colleagues and they were like, well, what kind of social life would you have if you can only eat in the morning? I mean, how do you have dinners with colleagues or go to a bar and watch the basketball, whatever it might mean. And so I For have sure. a couple of colleagues working elsewhere. There's a, there's a, a researcher in um, San Francisco who's looking at, well, what happens if you eat later in the day? So eat nothing in the morning and maybe eat from 2, 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. How does that work? And I think that that data, again, is going to be interesting in giving people a, a sustainable way of following time-restricted feeding. For sure, yeah. I mean, it's interesting when we look at even some of the uh, sports research around sort of that train low, sleep low strategies where somebody might wake up in the morning after a seven, eight, nine hour sleep, uh, you know, liver glycogen levels are low, they go out to train and of course, you know, fat oxidation increases. And in, in some of the other research, they show that even having a protein shake doesn't impair that ability. So, you know, perhaps there's an opportunity for some of these folks to be having some, you know, more protein rich meals outside of that window, but uh, look forward to seeing some of that research come through. Um, terrific. Well, I mean, there's another strategy, which I think 
most people aren't really familiar with, but will often see, um, you know, a lot of doctors use this approach in terms of their weight loss programs, and that's a very low energy diet. Can you define that for folks and, and yes. let us know how that relates to potentially support for type 2 diabetes? Absolutely, yes. So, so a very low energy diet is defined by, as, as a diet with fewer than 800 calories. Um, so that's the definition, but I'd like to make two things clear. Is One, it looks like calorie restriction per se probably has some of the same effects, um, as does marked weight loss. So let me explain that. Um, so people essentially thought that beta cells just declined over time and there was nothing we could do about it. So when people get type 2 diabetes, unfortunately, within 10 years, the majority have to go on insulin. And so it's always been thought that regardless of what you do, whether you give metformin, whether you give any other medications, people are going to end up on insulin because the beta cells failed. Then bariatric surgery came along. So this is the gastric bypass. And what was observed was that people with type 2 who underwent this surgery um, got totally normal glucose and could come off their medications within 24 to 48 hours. And so it got the research world thinking, well, oh, my goodness, what on earth is this doing? How are people curing, apparently, their type 2 diabetes? And one of the hypotheses was about the caloric restriction, because if you have bariatric surgery, you often go on a liver reduction diet prior to the surgery. So this is a two week period where you might have 800 calories a day. You then fast before the, the surgery. After the surgery, you can't eat properly. You go on a, a clear liquid diet where you're having two, 300 calories maybe, and then you gradually start increasing your food intake. So there's a long period where you're essentially, we can even call it semi-starvation. And so it got the research world interested in, well, maybe that's what's doing it. Maybe it's somehow giving the body a rest and the, pan or the beta cells can come back to life. And so there have now been, I mean, 15, 20 years of studies on this. Um, and in one of those studies, they took obese people with type 2 diabetes. Over a seven-day period, they gave them 400 calories a day. So you don't lose that much weight in seven days, even if you're having 400 calories. So these people lost about 1.3 uh, kilograms. You wouldn't expect any reduction, significant reduction in glucose from that. But they saw normalization of glucose and restoration of um, beta cell function. Incredible. And so there have been other studies that have tried to tease out this effect, like, is it the weight loss itself or is it the caloric restriction? And what it looks like is the two contribute independently. So what people are trying to do now in, in um, primary care, um, we had the direct style uh, study that came out last year where they put people on. It wasn't strictly a very low energy diet because people were on about 800 to 900 calories. They followed this diet for a period between two, three, four months. It was quite individual. Once people met their target, they then transitioned to food intake and were aiming for weight loss maintenance. Um, and in that study, it was people of type 2 diabetes of short duration, but 86% of people who lost 15 kilograms or more got remission of their type 2. So it certainly seems that massive weight loss, and it needs to be certainly above 10 kilograms, can get remission of established type 2 um, by restoring beta cell function. Um, but this, unbelievably, has not been tested in pre-diabetes. Um, and I think it should be um, because it most of the data shows, and this is true of bariatric surgery, the longer you have type 2, the less likely you are able to get remission and the less likely the beta cells are able to wake up. Now, of course, pre-diabetes is early, early type 2. Um, so I would bet my, bet my house, frankly, on um, a very low energy diet type intervention, um, really restoring beta cell function in people with prediabetes. Yeah, that's fascinating, uh, fascinating stuff. And, you know, of course, when we start to implement some of these strategies that are terrific in the short term or in a, a supervised setting, how, how do we shift clients over into establishing that that habit that routine of a new dietary approach because you know as you noted in, in these trials you know dropout rates are, are a real problem right anywhere sure, from absolutely. sort of 30 to 50 percent um so how do, how do we how do you think we can help people sort of transition into a plan that suits them um even if we're using some of these more aggressive strategies like some you know very low energy diets initially 
Sure. I mean, first of all, let me reiterate the great thing about prediabetes, and we don't fully understand why this is, is there is a legacy effect. So if you lose weight and then regain it, your risk is still lower than had you never lost weight at all. Um, so this is a message I always reiterate. Great news for clients, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, obviously, the longer you can maintain weight loss, the better. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the whole holy grail in, in weight loss and, and obesity is successful weight loss maintenance. Um, and this is really where personalization is key. And also in the context of these, these trials that we have. So in the UK, we have the NHS Diabetes Prevention Program. So it's a formal program. People sign up for nine months. Um, and basically what the data shows is the more face-to-face -face or individualized support you can give for the longest duration, that's what predicts um, successful weight loss maintenance. So there has to be a lot of support. Um, and it's worth mentioning indirect. So this was done in primary care. Um, people lost 15, uh, on average, 15 kilograms. They were able to maintain that pretty much for 12 months. But they were seen um, individually every two weeks, every month by um, a qualified person. Um, and that's how formally you get good weight loss. Um, nevertheless, there is a lot of encouraging um, data coming through from remote style options. So we had Verta in the US. Um, that was a, a study or it was a program, but they've produced data on it showing that a ketogenic type approach with lots of quite frequent, um, even daily support to follow a, a ketogenic diet seems to be really effective. Um, in that study, it wasn't randomized, but people lost 15 kilograms. Um, some people, or actually nearly half of people, came off their insulin completely. Um, so that looks to be an approach that can work. Um, in the U UK, we have data coming through from a digital diabetes prevention program. So this is basically the same program that's delivered in person, but it's delivered um, via an app and via um, the web. Um, that seems to have uh, pretty good results, and especially for younger people. Um, so I think there's no right way of doing this, and there's certainly no magic pill. Um, unfortunately, right now, the majority of people who try to lose weight will regain it uh, within five years. Um, and ultimately, and no one likes to hear this, until we change our environments, um, we're, we're not going to succeed in addressing the obesity um, epidemic, unfortunately. Thank you.